Hey everyone, Charles Judd here, taking a look at the topic of OSPF adjacencies. I want to specifically examine an OSPF packet capture using Wireshark. This is going to allow us to see the different OSPF states during adjacency formation. When we're forming an OSPF adjacency, OSPF goes through several state changes, which we'll look at with Wireshark in just a bit. But first, let's describe all of those states. The first one is the down state. This means that we've configured OSPF on a router, but no hello packets have been received from a neighbor. But a router in the down state can still send hello packets out to a neighbor. If we have a full adjacency and we stop receiving OSPF packets to the point where our dead interval reaches zero, then OSPF will move back to this down state. Next is a special state only valid for manually configured NBMA neighbors called the attempt state. Here a router will send unicast hello packets to a manually configured neighbor when no hello messages have been received within the dead interval. The next state is the init state, which is the state when a router has received a hello packet from a neighbor, but our own router ID was not included in that packet. The reason we're looking for our own router ID in that packet is that it indicates we have bi-directional communication. When a router receives a hello packet from a neighbor, the router will take the sending router's router ID and add that into its own hello packet as an acknowledgement. Once the router does start seeing its own router ID in those neighbor hello packets, that means that we have bi-directional communication between our routers, and so OSPF moves into the two-way state. This means our routers are seeing each other's hello packets, and they're acknowledging that by echoing back the neighbor router's router ID. At this point, the DR and BDR election also takes place, the designated router and the backup designated router. Once these are elected, we move to the X start state. This is where OSPF routers establish a master-slave relationship where the router with the highest router ID will become the master device. This is established on a per neighbor basis. And by the way, this relationship has nothing to do with the DR and BDR election. This is a completely separate process serving a completely separate purpose. It's entirely possible that the BDR could play the role of the master. This mechanism is essentially used as an acknowledgement system where the master is used to set an initial sequence number, and the master is also responsible for incrementing the sequence number. After this, we move to the exchange state, where our OSPF routers exchange DBD packets, database descriptor packets. These contain LSA headers, and they describe the contents of the entire link state database. So they are essentially a summary of our link state database. Each of these DBD packets has a sequence number, and that's set and incremented again by the master, as we just discussed. The contents of the DBD are compared to the information the router already knows about in its local link state database, and it does that in order to determine if more current link state information is available. Next, we have the loading state. This is where the actual exchange of link state information occurs. Based on the information found in the DBD packets, routers will send link state request packets to appear. Any outdated or missing LSAs would be requested through these link state request packets. The neighbor will respond with link state update packets, providing the requested information. Also, all of our link state requests and update packets are required to be acknowledged by the neighbor as well. And finally, we have the full state, where routers have formed a full adjacency with each other. Once all of the LSAs are exchanged between the peers and everything is acknowledged, then our databases are synchronized, and this is the state that we want to see. If we see a router stuck in any other state, this is an indication that we're having trouble forming a full adjacency. So let's take a look at this in a topology and we'll use Wireshark to see our different OSPF states. I have a couple of routers interconnected here. I've already got IP addressing configured and I have Wireshark running, filtering the capture output to only show OSPF packets on the gig zero slash zero interface of router one. I did that just to keep things a little more clear as we're examining our Wireshark capture. So let's configure OSPF. Let's start on router one. Let's say router OSPF1. Let's say router hyphen ID. I'll make that 1.1.1.1. I'll say network 
10.1.1.0 area zero. And as soon as I do that, you're gonna notice that we see a hello packet come into our Wireshark capture. And you'll see that these are gonna be happening at roughly every 10 seconds. They're happening at 10 second intervals. 10 seconds, of course, being our default hello interval in OSPF. You can see the destination of 224.0.0.5, which is the multicast address used with OSPF to send and receive hello packets. So at the moment, we are in the down state. I'll just expand our OSPF packet at the bottom. You can see the source OSPF router ID 1.1.1.1. You can see that this is a hello packet. And from here, you can also see the hello interval of 10 seconds and our dead interval of 40 seconds, both default values. So let's go over now to router two. Let's configure OSPF on that side as well. Let's say router OSPF one, router hyphen ID 2.2.2.2. Network 10.1.1.0, area zero. And we're gonna see our adjacency form. We'll see that happen in our console as well as in our Wireshark capture. So we'll give that just a moment for that to happen. See that happen. Let's break out let's say show IP OSPF neighbor. And you can see that we are in the full state, exactly what we'd want to see. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my Wireshark capture just so that we don't continue to have packets come in there. And we'll take a look at what we've captured now. Now, one interesting thing I'll point out right off the bat is if we look in our show IP OSPF output, you'll see that we have a full adjacency with router one. And we're told in this output that router one is the designated router. It's the DR. If you're familiar with DR and BDR election, you'll realize that with the default priority values in place, those are all the same. And based on the router IDs that I've configured, R2 has the higher router ID, and that should actually be the DR. Why is this the case that router one has determined it's the DR? Well, it's because of the time that I took to configure R2. R1 was waiting and waiting, and eventually it elected itself as the DR. OSPF DR election is what we call non preemptive. This means that even if we change the priorities or the router IDs so that other routers have better preference, the current DR is not going to change. This is opposed to a protocol such as spanning tree, which is preemptive and it will make changes to elected bridges. We can correct this by clearing our OSPF process. So let's do that. Let's jump over to router one. Let's say clear IP OSPF process. We'll say yes to reset those. We're gonna see our adjacency reset. We see that loading is done. So now if we say show IP OSPF neighbor, this time from router one, we have again a full adjacency, but we're told that now router two is the designated router as we would expect. And R1 has become the BDR. So this is just an interesting situation that you might run across. So I did want to explain that. And I wanted to explain the non preemptive condition that you might potentially see. I'll also point out that point to point OSPF networks do not require a DR and a BDR. So even though we have a couple of devices connected point to point here, I'm using Ethernet, and the default network type for that in OSPF is broadcast. And broadcast will elect a DR and a BDR. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the next video when we look at OSPF network types. Let's jump over and look at our packet capture now. So if we go to, let's scroll back up to the top, and we go to the very last hello packet that we sent before we started receiving hellos from R2. We see that here, packet number 85. We see the source of 10.1.1.1 going out to our multicast destination. If we look inside that packet, again, we see our source OSPF router ID 1.1.1.1, which is router one. We see we're in area zero listed as a backbone area. We see our network mask, our hello interval of 10 seconds, the dead interval of 40 seconds. And we see that we have made ourselves the DR at that point. And there's no backup designated router listed in there. The very next packet, number 86, if we look at that, we can see that the source of this packet is 10.1.1.2. .1 .1 
So at this point, we've configured R2 for OSPF. We have moved into the init state. We've received a hello packet from router two. But if you look inside that, we see a lot of the same things here. We see the source of 2.2.2.2, but we don't have router one's ID listed inside this packet. We see our source ID. Again, we see our area, all the things we would expect to see, but this packet does not have our one's router ID inside. That's what indicates that we are in the init state. We see that router two also doesn't know anything about the DR or BDR election just yet. So again, router one's information is not in this packet. So after router one receives this hello packet, it's going to have awareness of a neighbor. It's going to have awareness of router two, and then it's going to start embedding the neighbor's router ID within its own hello packet. And in fact, if we go down to our very next hello packet sourced from 10.1.1.1, you'll see that we now have a new field, an active neighbor listing, and it's listed that ID as 2.2.2.2, which is of course router two. So now we've moved into the two-way state and we've established bi-directional communication. You might notice the very next packet is a DB description, a database description packet that we've received from our neighbor. Receiving one of these will also cause a router in the init state to transition to the two-way state as well. If we go down to the very next hello packet, we see that R2 is doing the same thing as R1. We see that R2 now also has the active neighbor field and it knows about router one at 1.1.1.1. And we see both the designated router and the backup designated router listed here. The election of the DR and the BDR means we are now in the X start state. This state is where we are establishing our master-slave relationship and establishing an initial sequence number for acknowledgements. Initially, both routers are going to believe that they should be the master. In fact, if we go to this first database description packet from R2, and we expand some of these sections to take a look inside, we can scroll down, and you can see listed here, R2 has a flag set saying, yes, I am the master device. I think I'm the master device. And just below that, R2 has chosen 4493 as the initial sequence number. This is what router two wants to set the initial sequence number to for acknowledgement. If we go to the DB description packet below that, coming from R1, we see that it also has a flag set saying, I think I'm the master device. And it has chosen a different sequence number, 2712. That's what R1 wants to set the initial sequence number to. So who's going to win? Well, again, the highest router ID is going to win. So you might be tempted to think that the DR will always be the master device, but that's not necessarily true. Remember, DR and BDR election takes into account our priority values, while this acknowledgement mechanism does not. So if we look at the very next DBD packet, this is coming from R1. This time, it has the flag set to no. So this time it has submitted to router two and it's allowing router two to be the master device. And R1 is echoing back the suggested starting sequence number 4493. If we go back to the previous DB description packet from R2, you'll see the sequence number is 4493. Once R1 agrees that it is not the master device, Notice it sends back the same sequence number, letting it know, okay, this is the sequence number that we're gonna start with. R2 will follow that up with a second DB descriptor packet, and notice that it is incremented to 4494 now. So now that the initial sequence number is set and we know which router is responsible for incrementing that sequence, we move to the exchange state. We're exchanging DBD packets and these contain our LSA headers in order to determine if more current link state information is available. Now we're moving into the loading state. This is where the routers are exchanging link state information. We see a link state request here from R1. If we go down, we see a link state update sent out from R2, which is a response to the request from R1, and we see that happening in the opposite direction as well. We see R2 sending out a link state request, R1 providing an update. 
Once all of those LSAs are exchanged and our databases are synced, then we, of course, move into the full state. We'll see some more of this syncing happening back and forth. We see some acknowledgments as well. And then we begin sending those hello packets again to ensure that we keep our adjacency up. And of course, we will still receive any necessary link state updates from our peers, and we will continue to acknowledge those as well. So that's a look at OSPF adjacencies. I hope you found this content useful, and I want to thank you sincerely for watching.